Well, uh, honoring the memory of one of my oldest and best friends, uh, that uh, we met in early 40 years ago, and uh, we started a collaboration that later continued in Stony Brook, and it was really quite a magical time uh, for me. Uh, in Stony Brook, uh, in, in Berkeley at that time, I also met Susie, who's also one of my oldest friends, and with whom I've always felt a very special connection. Uh, work that I did with Detlef has certainly been uh, some of the most important to me, and I believe he felt the same way about it. Uh, this work uh, continued uh, something that he had started with uh, Wolfgang. Uh, and the main themes uh, of rigidity and later quantitative rigidity and stability that were the key in that work uh, has really uh, influenced all of my work since then. And indeed, they'll play a role uh, in the time of the talk today. In particular, with regard to quantitative rigidity, I want to uh, call attention to the uh, pioneering uh, fundamental breakthrough of Operation Gromal. Uh, a little more than uh, 20 years ago, the Operation from Wall Inequality, which was uh, a precursor uh, to the uh, quantitative splitting theory. Uh, Detlef was really an exceptional mathematician, and uh, his work was characterized, first of all, by superb taste, and among other quantities, uh, by perfectionism, and above all, I would say, by his love of simple, beautiful, and powerful ideas. Uh, he was also an outstanding uh, person. No one, uh, he never had an unkind word for anyone, and everyone he met uh, really held him in the highest esteem. So, okay, now let me start with the talk, uh, which is, uh, about the quantitative behavior of the Schitt's maps from the Heisenberg group uh, to the, the space Big L1. So this is very similar to uh, a talk which they gave here in February. So some people will be hearing it for the second time and a few in the future here the third time. Uh, so uh, let me start. Uh, by considering a metric space, and so that means I have a fixed metric B, and then some other collection of metrics on the space X, uh, with the property that it's closed under scaling. And then let's define a notion of distance from the given metric uh, to this collection of metrics. Uh, so by this condition here, so in other words, we try, uh, distance could be infinity, we try to find the best constant that makes them as Lipschitz as possible, as close to uh, symmetry as possible. So this is a kind of Lipschitz distance of our metric to some particular family or class of metrics. So of particular importance in the talk uh, will be the class of metrics on X which are induced from maps to L1. So I'll call that script L of X. So that's what this says, the metric is induced uh, from a map to L1. And there's a famous, uh, very basic theorem of Morgan, which says that if I have a finite metric space, then if the cardinality is N, you can always find the metric induced by a map to L1, such that the distortion is at most some universal multiple of log n. So in this sense, uh, L1 is good. I mean, of course, if you had L infinity, uh, then you can embed isometrically, but uh, L1 um, is good for other reasons, um, which will be indicated, although not explained in detail at the moment. Um, and 
In fact, uh, in Borgen's theorem, uh, you get both an upper bound and a lower bound. So really, the same result would hold for any q between 1 and infinity. It's bounded. The map it constructs is one Lipschitz, and it's bound below uh, in the L1 one. So now I want to next consider a slightly more general class of metrics, which are called metrics of negative type. I'll uh, so say why in a second. Um, you know, what the terminology is. So it turns out um, that you can very easily. So if I have any metric and I raise the distance function to a power less than one, positive power less than one, it's also a metric. So this is an elementary and well-known fact. It starts to have a fractal nature if you do that. There are no rectifiable curves once you do it. But it is a metric. So consider big L1, L1 function. L, big L1 means L1 functions on the line, let's say, with the square root of its usual metric. So that's a metric. And this can be isometrically embedded. Uh, the one I know isn't linear, but there's a very simple, uh, simple isometric embedding into L2 <coughs> standard metric. So uh, more generally, given a, really a set X, let's consider all the metrics with that same property that the square root embeds isometrically <coughs> into L2. So if the metric were induced from L1, it would have that property. But there are more metrics that have that property. So being of this so-called negative type is a necessary but not sufficient condition for uh, embedding in L1. So script L is contained in this script A. And hence the uh, distortion or the distance of a given metric from script N will be smaller since there are more possibilities. Uh, then it will be uh, the distance, the Lipschitz distance, the script L. Um, so negative type actually just means uh, this condition, uh, the square root embedding uh, in L2 is equivalent, it turns out, to if you make the matrix whose ij entry is the distance from xi to xj, so it's a finite metric space, then that's uh, negative definite symmetric uh, matrix. So it turns out that that's equivalent to this condition, which just explains the terminology, but it won't play any further role here. Uh, it's known that for negative type metrics, you can improve Morgan's result and replace the log n distortion, which can be improved in general by uh, square root of log n. Now, So now the next thing I want to talk about is uh, a conjecture which came from theoretical computer science. So this is so let me explain the context, which uh, was the context in which uh, the results of the talk uh, were told, uh, where the problem that I want to discuss uh, was explained to me in, in this context. One reason why it's an interesting problem. So it turns out that the problem of computing, having a, a, an algorithm which, given a metric on a finite set, uh, computes uh, this distortion uh, between it and all the metrics in L1, the closest L1 metric to it, is actually it's not difficult to show, although you might not think of it. It's equivalent to other fundamental problems in computer science. So, if there were an efficient algorithm, efficient, I gather, generally means polynomial time, in which uh, you could compute this distortion. I'm not even talking about finding the embedded, but compute this uh, distortion in polynomial time, that would be a uh, big deal. And it's believed, in fact, there's no uh, such algorithm. Uh, however, uh, so in particular, this is very closely related to the problem of the so-called sparsest cut, where you have, for example, maybe a graph. Uh, and the metric is the shortest path. And the, the sparsest cut, um, you want to partition it into two sets, 
such that the ratio of the number of edges, with one endpoint in one set, one endpoint in the other set, you think of that as the cardinality of the boundary. So that divided by the smaller of the cardinalities of the two sets is as small as possible. So that's a fundamental problem in, in computer science. And while it's believed that there's no polynomial time algorithm, there was a quadratic time algorithm uh, it was found uh, for computing the distortion to this larger class of metrics, the ones of negative type. So the hope was that uh, this would actually turn out to give you the answer for the original problem distortion for L1 metrics within a bounded mode. This was a hope. And that would have been a really big deal if it had been true in this particular work. Um, so this was the conjecture of Gomans and Linear. So it's known that there is this problem um, for which there's a polynomial time algorithm. Uh, and it's hoped that within the universal constant that that algorithm would actually give you the answer to the original problem. Now in 2005, Code and Vishnoi constructed a sequence of examples. So this is not a problem about one metric space, right? It's a problem about the asymptotic behavior of a sequence. So they gave a sequence of examples uh, that showed that this conjecture was false, but the distortion grew rather slowly as a function of the cardinality family uh, log log. The examples in their natural description uh, grew in dimension weren't doubling. I mean, they may have been natural in certain ways, but in any case, one concrete thing you can say is that the distortion was log log. Uh, so in the rest of the talk, I want to discuss um, a very natural kind of uh, sequence of examples that is constructed from the Heisenberg group, which is a canonical object in many ways. Uh, and uh, it has uh, distortion that grows more rapidly than they log in to a power. And on the other hand, you know that uh, one half is the best that you can do. So it has kind of the same character as in the work against uh, theorem. So this is joint work with uh, Bruce Kleiner and uh, now Orr. And it's an outgrowth of earlier work uh, of Lee and Nahor. Nahor was the one who told Bruce and myself about the problem. Uh, and uh, uh, Bruce and myself, as I will explain. So let me remind you briefly what the Heisenberg group is. And for our purposes, the three dimensional Heisenberg group will be enough. So this is a Lee group, which you can think comes as close as possible to being abelian without being abelian. This is one reason why it's uh, such a canonical object. So uh, you can just think of it, on the one hand, as upper triangular matrices. And that representation, the formula for the multiplication is just slightly different from this one. It would look more like this term would be missing. So uh, the minus e a prime term. So, Actually, this is a more symmetrical representation of upper triangular matrices, but it's isomorphic to upper triangular matrices. And uh, therefore, as the space is just R3, the topology is just R3. But, um, okay, so at this point, we're just interested in the group structure as a one dimensional center, which is, corresponds to the third coordinate. And if you divide by the center, you get the vector group R2. So you can think of it, if you like, as upper triangular matrices. Uh, so two uh, important uh, features of this group is there's this automorphism uh, for any positive lambda which acts inhomogeneously on the coordinates. It's a kind of inhomogeneous uh, scaling. And it will also be an inhomogeneous scaling of the metric that we're going to use. Um, and if you think in terms of upper triangular matrices, uh, 
there's a, a lattice, a co-compact subgroup, say, just when the entries are integers. And so if you apply the automorphism, uh, again, it gives you uh, some kind of lattice. And if lambda is small, that lattice is very dense. That's what that's what you want it to be. So, for example, in the unit ball, uh, you could make it denser and denser by taking lambda small. Okay, now there's a certain distance which I'll describe from a different point of view towards the end of the talk, but for the moment, uh, let's just say that um, without worrying is it a distance, that distance between two points, I'll say what the distance is exactly at the end, but it's bounded in above and below by uh, uh, a multiple of this expression. So in particular, if one of the points, let's say a prime, b prime, c prime, were the origin, then um, this cross term here would be missing. And the ball in this metric looks approximately like uh, the Euclidean ball in the first two coordinates, but then it's the square root of the Euclidean distance in the second, in the third coordinate. So actually it looks like a kind of flattened cylinder, because if distance is bigger, then it means the ball is smaller. So the ball looks like a flattened cylinder, it's smaller than the Euclidean ball. And if I just considered a pair of points on the z-axis, let's say, where a and b and a prime b prime were zero, then I get the square root of the usual distance for the distance in this metric. So it's one of these square root metrics, uh, in a different way. And in particular, no curves along the z-axis are rectifiable. Now, there's a natural measure on this, let's say, Hausdorff measure. Uh, and the Hausdorff dimension is actually uh, 4. And this is because of the square root in the z-axis. Now, the measure is the big measure on R3. But as I just explained, the balls are smaller, so they have smaller measures. So in fact, the measure is just a measure of uh, R2 to the 4. And now, there are other ways of thinking of this metric, and one way is to say if we restrict it to the lattice I was talking about before, then uh, it's by Lipschitz to the word metric. Uh, so I'll just uh, put a uh, on this lattice. Another way is you just take a left invariant metric on the whole group and you scale it down and bring it in from the infinity and it becomes degenerate. Why is the word metric by <laughs> well, it, it kind of is. There's some confusing point here. Because if you bring the B group metric in from infinity, it becomes this much. But the ball. So, okay. Lee and Orr actually showed that this, this metric, I haven't quite shown you the metric yet, but just something that uh, explains what the distance is. So they, they found the left invariant distance, uh, which is by Lipschitz uh, to this one, the so-called Carnot Caritadori distance, is the one I've been alluding to. So they found something by Lipschitz to it, which um, is of negative type. So this was one point. And they conjectured that this would give a counterexample uh, to the Spelman's linear conjecture. Um, in fact, I was told me about this idea before the paper of prohibition, but by the time we had worked out this example, uh, their counterexample uh, had shown the conjecture was false. Um, so they conjectured that this doesn't violate this embed um, in L1. And this turns out to be equivalent to a kind of discrete version uh, just for the very dense lattices that they don't embed uh, uniformly. Um, and in fact, we'll see if you can quantify it as, as I indicated earlier. Uh, 
So just the fact that there's no embedding of the Heisenberg group or even a unit ball in the Heisenberg group with this Carnot character, Theodore metric, uh, in L1 was proved by Kleiner and myself uh, in around 2006, but it was not a quantitative result. Okay. It didn't say how you have a map to L1, you show on a small enough scale, let's say a Lipschitz, one Lipschitz map on a small enough scale, actually it compresses distances in the xy direction. In, sorry, in the z direction, it becomes degenerate on almost every line parallel to the z axis. That's what we showed. But we didn't say, we didn't quantify it in the sense of if you go to a certain scale, you'll see a certain amount of degeneracy. And that's what uh, the main point of today's talk. So, in the process of describing that, uh, we'll also describe some of the things that went into the earlier. Now here's something to keep in mind in this uh, story. Uh, see, one way you might try to study uh, whether maps become degenerate or not, or their behavior on a small scale, is if you had a kind of differentiation theory, which certainly does exist for certain in infinite dimensional targets, like, for example, LP, between, strictly between one and infinity. Uh, you have a Lipschitz. So if you have a Lipschitz map from R to R, it's a famous, it's, well, it's actually a kind of theorem from first year measure theory. You've got a year course that is differentiable almost every Lipschitz map. The, the domain is Rn, and uh, the range could be Rk. It's still differentiable almost everywhere, and that's the famous fundamental theorem of Pradamon. Uh, for certain Bonnock space targets, again, go back to the case where the domain is, is R, it's still true that Lipschitz map is differentiable almost everywhere. Differentiable just means that you take the, the difference quotient in the direction, in the, in the definition of a derivative, and it approaches a limit in Bonnock space almost everywhere. Now, if you were dealing with such a Bonnock space, it kind of stands to reason that you might be able to use differentiability to study the embedding problem because, you know, it says on a sufficiently small scale the map looks simpler than linear. So uh, that would simplify your problem. Now the thing about maps to L1 is this is simply not true. They're not differentiable. So here's uh, the standard uh, counterexample. If you map R, say R plus to L1 by mapping the point T to the characteristic function of zero T, uh, then you can just compute the difference quotient, right? You just imagine it in your head. You have the characteristic function, slightly longer interval, you subtract almost everything cancels, divide by delta T, and it looks approximately like a delta function concentrated at the point T. Now, of course, uh, the characteristic function is an LP for other P's for which the differentiation theorem is true, but the map, if you look into it, is not Lipschitz. So, so here is Lipschitz, and it's not differentiable for any T. Right? The derivative exists only in some weak sense, and it's an object that doesn't live in the L1 space. It's a L1. So you cannot hope to use differentiation theory, and this counterexample was, of course, known. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was known that there was a problem in trying to apply this approach. However, what we found was there's a weaker sense, not in the sense of a weak derivative, but something, but a strong something less than a derivative uh, does exist, and that this can be used to study the embedding problem. And that was the main point uh, in the paper of uh, Bruce and myself, where we showed that the Heisenberg group, in fact, or even said unit ball, just to be clear, uh, doesn't embed in L1. So we use this kind of novel uh, notion of differentiation, where something existed in a strong sense, but it wasn't quite a derivative part of the information that to be ignored. So this proved the sharper version of the Lina or conjecture in the sense that I said before that not only does the map uh, become 
degenerate, but in fact you can say it compresses almost every uh, poset of the center that becomes a degenerate or every vertical line, uh, which is actually a similar to its component. But let's just look at that for a moment. So now I want to get to the quantitative version of this result. Um, the one which uh, is the counterexample to the Roman thing of conjecture. And this part is joined with corner and no or. So in the course of this, you know, obviously we can give some insight into the original proof, but it involves additional ideas. Uh, so I won't try to explain the original argument itself. Uh, maybe I should just point out the following, what this has to do with the original problem, which was actually about finite vector spaces, so this could cause some, some confusion. But there's a simple explanation. So the finite metric spaces that are going to be in the counterexample to the original conjecture are just going to be these lattices uh, scaled down in the, and intersected with the unit ball. Uh, the point is that if you have such a lattice, you can, and, and the conjecture was about, say, one Lipschitz map of such lattices into big L1. But you can easily extend it to a map of the whole Heisenberg group, uh, just using a partition of unity, so to say, based on distance functions. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying if the original thing was an embedding, you know, you might be worried, is this one an embedding? But it's not difficult to extend it to a one Lipschitz map. So just using the fact that the Heisenberg, well, just using a kind of coordinate system based on this, the usual coordinate system. So using a partition of unity, if you like. So you can do this only in, in increasing the Lipschitz constant by a definite multiple. So now if you have a quantitative result for the continuous case, you know, then you restrict it back and it gives you something about the lattice maybe on a larger scale than the density of your, your lattice, certainly no bigger, but no small. Right? It, it can't give you something, let's say, on a smaller scale. But if you have a quantitative result of that continuous case, then it implies uh, about the lattice. Um, it's, of course, in some ways more convenient to formulate it for the continuous case, of course, then you can use whatever calculus type results you can come up with. Restriction to a small ball and a small ellipsis. Well, maybe I didn't get the. Maybe I didn't get yeah, a smaller. Well, when you restrict it, you have to. scale both the domain and, and the range, and it will still be one ellipsis. Right. But I want to say that any one ellipsis map you started with. Right. Now, as usual, like in the sense of calculus, I want to inspect it under a microscope. You know, this is just saying, look at the difference question. Like, I'm saying that you'll, you'll find the, you know, the derivative is zero, so you say, but it's impressive. So it's automatic with one lecture this point. You'll see if you examine it on a small scale for a typical fiber, it becomes more and more. So the restriction. Yeah, it's restriction to a vertical line. Impressive. 
compression. Exactly, this pigeon. Uh, 
then once you get to the scale where the non-monotonicity is small, everything else is kind of like calculus on that scale. Not exactly calculus, but it only involves a power of those. So those are the kind of two steps. So are you saying worried about what sum over scales means? Well, uh, I'm going to explain it at the end, but I mean, it's, so it's first of all a number. There's a natural way of writing this number as an infinite sum of other numbers. And the other numbers measure some property about the behavior of the map on each scale. Think, you know, on each scale. So scale means one over a power of two. So you kind of look at how bad it is on each scale, suitably renormalized so that all scales are true. And uh, so this original energy you can write as a sum of measurements, one attached to each scale, which measures how bad it is on that scale. And when you find a scale, as you will from the pigeonhole principle, because the original quantity is a priori found, of which it's small, then that's the scale on which you, that shows you're guaranteed to find this you know, behavior. Yeah. So, so we could be like you look at the wall over there, that's one scale. You do something in every box to get the concrete. Right. That that's right. Scale. If the total thing is small on that scale, it's going to have to be small in most of the boxes. In the box where it's small, that's where you'll find this bad behavior, this degenerate behavior. No, no, I understand the digital thing. I just don't understand what, what you mean by a scale. Or I, I, like the, 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 the wall is one scale. But the wall the wall. Or tile on the wall. Well, I can examine I can examine the map on ball basically I can examine the map on balls of radius one over two to the n. <laughs> so right? Look at how it behaves on such balls. Right? For every n. That's what I mean by scale. It's the n. The two to the n. Okay. So you just have to find something on which what I'm telling you to think of an energy is small, but then on that scale, after you kind of remagnify the unit size, uh, now the scale is out of the picture, and you do something that looks like you know calculus or something, it's not quite calculus, but you know something that you would think would just give you a power of epsilon. The energy is some power epsilon to the a, then you get compression uh, by a factor epsilon. So all I want to, so what I want to say is that this mechanism uh, will give you quantitative estimates in you know very many situations you can easily think of your own uh, situation. So what we're using is that the thing that controls the situation. So coercive means you could think of the skier theory. So Coercive means you have some quantity which in the sphere theorem would be pinching. The pinching log of the pinching, let's say, is small. That is, the pinching is close to one, it means you're close to the sphere. Right? So that's what I mean. So the coercive quantity is what I'm calling this non monotonicity. And it's a priori bounded, right? Then you can use it. And if it can be written as a sum over uh, locations and scales, locations so, or let's say the sum over scales, then it has to be small on some estimable scale. Now, uh, you know, sometimes instead of scales, you have a time-dependent quantity. So the crucial property, in a way, in that case, would be monotonicity in, in a different sense. And another example, which may be good for this audience, uh, where you have the same principle, is Think of the bishop chromo inequality. So it says a certain ratio of volumes is monotone, right? So if it's monotone, and suppose it's bounded below, if your, your ball is not too collapsed. And the limit, if the radius goes to zero, it becomes one, and then it decreases out to this radius one. So now look at its behavior in between, just because it's a monotone quantity. So this is the analog of sum over scales. On most scales, that ratio has to be constant because it's bounded multiplicatively above and below. So there could be only 
a finite number of scales that at the end points, so to say, between 1 over 2 to the n, 1 over 2 to the n plus 1, or you could replace 2 by anything, the, the ratio isn't very close to 1. Right? Because it's monotone. So many such things, including involving division chroma, many quality, and many, many other estimates could be made quantitative in this way, although typically they're not stated in this way. So this is, this is really what's, what's going on. Um, OK. So now, the next point is I want to say what it is we use about L1, uh, what property of L1 can't be differentiated or produce something else. So there's a representation theorem, uh, which, say, in the case where it's a finite L1, finite set, uh, is well known. And it says that a metric induced from L1 can be written as a combination with positive coefficients of a very simple kind of degenerate uh, really a pseudometric since it's not a metric. So suppose I'm given a set x. I want to define a very simple type of degenerate metric on it. Namely, take a subset E. So now define the quote distance, which could be zero even when the points are distinct, between two points, to be actually zero unless one point is in the set and the other is in the complement which case, say, the distance is 1. So that's a very simple kind of pseudo metric. Okay. Now, suppose that we have some measure on the set of all subsets of x. Then you could imagine taking a linear, a weighted linear combination with positive weights of uh, such uh, simple measures. So that's, we'll call that a cut metric. And I wrote instead of a sum, that's an integral. So I just, just kind of think of this formal. So that's now a more general class of okay. So it's more or less well known that a metric having a representation of this type is equivalent to its being induced from L1. So let me try to explain where that comes from. So I'll explain it just for a finite set and a finite uh, L1, but formally it's completely uh, the same. So, uh, so, so the image is given by an n-tuple of functions if it's going into the Rn of the L1 metric. And let E of t and i denote the super level set where the function, the i coordinate, is bigger than or equal to t. Think of the measure on, Z, on Zn, or just a set of n points that counts the n coordinates, uh, as the just the measure that makes every point have mass 1. So then we have this well-known representation, cut metric representation, uh, where you can think of the cuts, the subsets, as being these super level sets where I let t and i vary. t varies in the real line, and i varies from 1 to n. And the cut measure, the measure sigma, is just a product measure. And I claim that this is the pullback metric. You can write it in this form. Okay, you can write it in this cut metric representation. And why is that? So. By definition, it's the sum of differences of the absolute values of differences of the coordinates. So I just take the absolute value of the difference of two numbers, and I think of that as the measure of the interval of those numbers as n points in the notation. I write this way, even irrespective of which one is the bigger one. That, that means the interval from the small one to the bigger one. So this absolute value of the difference is the integral over r of the characteristic function of the interval. So rewrite it in that way. And then notice that t is a point of r for which the characteristic function of this interval has value 1 if, if and only if the distance with respect to uh, this elementary cut metric 
corresponding to the super level set is 1. Okay. So that's, that's what this is. Okay. So this, what? No, I think I defined it next in the, well, ETI was a super level set, right? Yeah. And if this is any set whatsoever, this is the elementary, uh, no, it's on this one, right? So for any set E, right, this is the elementary type of associated with the ETI is a super level set of the I4. Uh, corresponding to the set where the i coordinate takes value bigger than or equal to t. Okay, so there's nothing about, you could imagine more general, formally similar representations of this type, but I haven't said anything about Lipschitz maps. So now, suppose that, Let's think in the Heisenberg group of what I'm going to say is much more general. Suppose that the map to L1 is Lipschitz with respect to the standard metric, right? That wasn't in the picture yet. Then you would like to say more about this cut metric representation. So what does it sort of mean? If you move a little bit in X, you have two coordinate, you know, you, you have two functions in L1 which are close in L1. In fact, close meaning as the Lipschitz condition tells you. So the functions are only in L1, but the variation as I move around in X is Lipschitz. Now a map from, suppose X has a measure, like it would if it were the Heisenberg group, as the vague measure of the flow of this R3. So then, in effect, I have a map from R3 to functions on the line which, if you think about it, is it just a function of two variables, right? Uh, so now I can kind of look at it in the reverse way uh, of fixing the one that varied in the line and associate each point in the line, I get uh, a function on x, right? So to each x, I get a function of y, right, x of x of y, which I think of as f of x of y, right? So now, just by symmetry for each y, I get some other, let's call it maybe h is the y of x, okay? Now, this map, this was, this was only an L1 function, right? This, this was only an L1 function, but the dependence on x is Lipschitz. If you just sort of think about what this gives you, you come to the conclusion that if you look at it in the opposite direction, you have a weaker dependence now on y. It's only measurable. But the function h sub y of, of x is a better function. It's actually a function of bounded variation, not an L1 function, but there's some control on this derivative, the integral sense. So this is a kind of dual, or this is a kind of duality. It's a kind of dual formulation of the original problem. Now, in fact, the, the cuts would be the super level sets of these functions as y varies in the real line. It's L1 of the real line. Y is the variable L1 of the real line. So there will be the super level sets of these functions of bounded variation. Uh, in fact, there's a kind of integral of the variation that's also bounded, and it's bounded in terms of the Lipschitz constant. Now, a superlevel set of a function of bounded variation, so we want this discussion in the Heisenberg group where it makes sense, but if you, if you happen to be more familiar with functions of bounded variation uh, where the domain was Rn, that would be perfectly fine for this as well. So these super level sets, right, their boundaries, these are what are called sets of finite perimeter. The boundaries of the super, the super level sets, like the things down here, have finite n minus one dimensional area in the generalized sense that's, that comes from geometric measure theory. They're called sets of finite perimeter and they're studied in geometric measure 
So, in other words, if the map is Lipschitz, then the cuts that arise in the cut metric representation have some regularity. The boundaries have a finite area in some generalized sense. And the theory, these have been studied in geometric measure theory. And it's known that this means the boundary is kind of rectifiable and it has a tangent plane in a generalized sense at almost every point, right? Which means if you blow up the boundary, it starts to look like a plane. So there is some infinitesimal regularity in this picture. It's just not exactly the derivative. Uh, but there is, but nonetheless. So even in Euclidean space, this is a new way of looking at maps to the L1. So this is one point. So this theory of sets of finite perimeter uh, was originally due to De Georgi in RN, and more recently for the Heisenberg geometry associated to the Carnot Caritador metric. This was done by uh, the heirs to uh, De Georgi's tradition, uh, specifically these guys, but Ambrosio also played a role in, in, this, uh, in this business. So, uh, in particular, strangely, for the Heisenberg group, even though it's a more complicated object, or maybe because it's a more complicated object, you can actually say more than in Euclidean space. So it looks slightly bizarre, but when you blow these sets, these sets up at almost every point, it looks like not only a half space, but a vertical half space. That is, we have this map dividing by the center to R2, take an inverse image of a half space in R2, I'll call it a vertical half space, and that's what these things start to look like. So in the proof with Bruce, we use this, and it's very easy to uh, see why. So let's not worry why they're, they're vertical. Uh, I tried to explain this the last time I gave this talk, but actually this time we're not going to need to give a different explanation. It doesn't do so. uh, it's very easy to explain why they become vertical, but we're not going to need it anyway. But this was our original understanding. A vertical half space, if you think of the associated cut metric, right? vertical half space, all a vertical line is either all in it or all in the complement all the boundary in any case. Uh, essentially, it induces a trivial metric on every vertical line, right? Because it's a vertical half space. So if you believe this result without understanding at this point where it came from, then it makes it, then, then it, makes it very reasonable uh, uh, to think that, you know, the metric becomes degenerate in the direction of process in the center. What is it? And so it's almost a few right? Right. Just have to say it carefully. <laughs> and that was just all we tried to do. Hopefully, we did. Um, so, really, in effect, we proved a certain version of their theorem. I mean, we used their theorem, just kind of made it for families, for measured families with finite uh, total perimeter. However, then we gave a second proof. Uh, which, although it depended on uh, the cut metric representation, uh, uh, actually avoided uh, their theory. Um, and it used, as I was just saying a minute ago, a kind of cruder blow-up result. Uh, so we just showed, in effect, that every blow-up is some half space. We didn't care if it's vertical. They showed, actually, the tangent plane is unique, but we don't care about that either. Now, this could be an advantage if you could get away with it, right? Because, you know, you're trying to make it quantitative, so you shouldn't use a finer result than you need if you don't need it, right? Because that might be where you find the more refined behavior might be on a much smaller scale. So there's nothing wrong with what we did. So we proved a, a prudent result with a completely different proof. Uh, so namely, we introduced the idea of a set that we'll call monotone. Now, I'll explain what this is get to the end, but for the moment, uh, 
Now, when I come to the definition, this would be a triviality if I was working in RN, but the Heisenberg group is not so trivial. Okay. So the crucial thing is that monotone sets are half space. Now, why is that enough? So how are we going to uh, get around the verticality which seems to uh, be so important in the other proof? Well, uh, if I have a cut, imagine you had a cut which was actually supported on half spaces. Okay? So that's a special case. Suppose it happened to be just all the sets in your cut method were half spaces. Then, if you think about what it would do to a vertical line, right? It's intersection, a half space intersected with a vertical line. Uh, it's either the whole line or uh, it divides it into two pieces, two semi infinite intervals, something like this, one of which could be. Uh, and an exceptional case. Now, from that, you see that the metric associated to that cut would have the property that the triangle inequality is actually equal. That is, if I have the two points and the point in between them, then the sum of the distances that that cut gives you just by inspection is actually equal to the distance between the other points. If you take a convex combination of such things, it will still have that problem. Right. On the other hand, we said that the Heisenberg metric restricted to the vertical lines was the square root of the usual metric. So this is kind of a length space metric, the induced metric, and the other one is some kind of snowflake metric, which is much bigger, much bigger. When you take the square root of a small distance, it becomes much bigger than what before. Basically, for that reason, you see very easily and in a quantitative sense if you could know that you were in this situation, then you would be quickly done with an estimate. You want to see compression epsilon, it's basically on the scale epsilon squared. If you could say you were in this situation. Okay. Now the non-monotonicity is going to be a measure of how far you are from this situation. Okay. So let me try to uh, See, so here we didn't use the verticality, and we didn't use anything about uniqueness, which the Italians proved, but this is a quite different part. So, what? We did not use the verticality in what I just said. Just said, if you have a vertical line, and you have a half space, and it divides the line into two intervals, you know, such a cut metric on the line associated with, you know, a semi Interval has the property that the triangle inequality is a huge quality in the sense that I said. So, but a metric like that uh, cannot look like the square root snowflake metric. Uh, you see that in a few lines. So, all right. So now the plan of the proof then is the following, or the outline of the proof is, is the following. So, as mentioned earlier, you introduce this quantity which uh, we're going to try to get to, called the non-monotonicity, which is a sum over scales. And then there's a kinematic formula for the Heisenberg group, which uh, basically gives you the perimeter of a set in terms of the intersection of certain lines. But you can think of the corresponding formula in the Euclidean space, but as we'll see, in the Heisenberg group, you don't get to use all the lines. Uh, from this, it follows uh, very directly that this non-monotonicity is bounded by a definite multiple of the integral with respect to the cut measure of the perimeters of your cuts. And that was bounded in terms of the Lipschitz constant. So this is the bound on the non-monotonicity. And then by the pigeonhole principle, we find a, a scale uh, where uh, the non-monotonicity is small. Uh, now, on this scale, at most locations, uh, the non-monotonicity is also is also small, and we can reduce. In fact, this takes a little more arguing to the case where, on at that location, the mass of the cut measure can be treated as having a definite bound, and we can assume that the non-monotonicity is small with respect to the mass. So this is going by in a hurry, but this part of the argument uses the isobar metric in the following. So all I mean to say is this. 
if I had a result about infinite, about cuts that said if in some sense they have small monotonicity, they're close to half spaces, I still would have to worry because I'm talking about the integral of something with respect to this cut measure, which actually has infinite mass. It's, it's d3, dt across something. So small is not enough. Somehow it has to, I have to deal with the fact that mass of the cut measure could be infinite. So I have to do some more. Um, and that, interestingly, the isoparametric inequality for the Heisenberg group comes in, but that's a technical point which we can ignore. So then, in effect, modulo that point, uh, we come to this uh, stability theorem, and this is what I mentioned earlier, uh, being kind of like uh, pinching quantitative rigidity and so on. I mean, it's very much like it in my mind. Think about it, which is just a way of saying if this non monotonicity, which I will promise you I will say what it is, uh, is small, then on a smaller concentric ball, uh, sufficiently small, after rescaling, your set looks close to a half space. Okay? So the non monotonicity is something like pinching, which makes Pinch close to one, it's close to a sphere. The non monotonicity, whatever it is, is small. Your set is close to a half space. Interestingly enough, you have to go to a smaller ball before you can uh, conclude this. And then we're basically back in the situation where the cut measure was just supported on half spaces, the triangle inequality is an equality, and then it's very easy to see that such a metric can't look like uh, the Heisenberg snowflake metric on the Okay, so now, uh, very quickly, um, maybe I have a, uh, three or four extra minutes, let me just try to be more specific, including saying what the non monotonicity is. So, here's the thing about the Heisenberg geometry. It has, first of all, the Heisenberg group has a left invariant field with two points. This is kind of well known. It's actually a connection on the principle of Munkel, who's group is the one-dimensional center. So you just take the xy plane, use the multiplication formula I wrote down, and transfer this plane to every point. So you get a distribution of two planes on the Heisenberg group. Because the group is non-commutative, this is not infinite, quite non-infinite. It's left invariant. So it's not integrable in one place, it's not integrable anywhere. So let's make a notion of a special kind of line in a horizontal line, we'll call it, which is a line which passes through a point, ABC, and lies in the two-plane attached to that point. So most lines are out of bounds. In fact, this is a co-dimension one family of lines which we'll call horizontal lines. And in particular, most pairs of points don't lie on one of these lines, right? Only special pairs of points. So that makes things considerably uh, more awkward. However, nonetheless, it's true, you know, you're allowed to, you're talking about a distance function, you could use broken lines, or even horizontal curves. So, because of the non-integrability, it's not difficult to see, right, that any two points can be connected by a curve that's everywhere tangent to this distribution. If we're integrable, it would form a foliation you could never get off of your own leaf, but it's not. And so, for example, you can go up the z-axis by kind of circling away and then coming back. So it's like Holonom, if you think of it as a principle of bundle. So, um, so now you can define the distance as the integral length of horizontal curves. And this is the so-called uh, carnot caratay metric. With respect to this distance, all the lines except the horizontal ones actually have infinite length. Um, including the vertical ones, which we saw were snowflakes. Okay, now we get to the concept of monotonicity. So, we call a set monotone, uh, basically we want to say if it and its complement look convex, but where convex is the, the only we look at horizontal lines. So, it's just if, we're, if we define the corresponding concept in Rn, say with respect to all lines, and then it would be clear that a monotone set is a half space. Look at what the definition is. 
says because it would say it and its complement are convex. Here, it's the same condition only with a smaller subset of lines. And yet, strangely enough, it turns out that the monotone subsets, namely those which, for which they and the complement is convex with respect to this particular codimension in one set of lines is again just the half space. So that's what monotone is. And then we have, I think there are only there are two more transparencies. Uh, now we have the kinematic formula, which was proved relatively recently. It's like a formula in RN, which says that you can compute the perimeter by looking at each line. You count the number of intersection points, and you integrate over the space of all horizontal lines compute this perimeter that I was talking about. So, so this is like a corresponding well-known formula in the Euclidean space. And it's true in Carnot's in general. So now I can say how you write this non-monotonicity um, as a sum over scales. So if we have the perimeter as expressed as an integral, just fix a set as an integral over lines where we count the number of intersection points. We can write the perimeter as a sum where we keep track since a pair of intersection points is an interval or we, we has an is the endpoints of, of an interval. So for every intersection point it comes as the endpoint of an interval. So we can remember that when we count that intersection point Remember, it's interval length between 2 to, two to the minus n and 2 to the minus n plus 1, let's say, and we throw it into that bucket. So all the perimeter points, all the intersection points that we're counting get thrown into buckets depending on the scale of intervals that they bound. So in that way, we write the perimeter as a kind of measure which is a sum uh, over scales. So now, what you see rather easily is if on some scale that measure is small, then it really looks like a monotone set on that scale. And that's the idea. And why? Because the intervals that are larger than the scale, they only look like they intersected in a connected set. Because the other endpoint of the interval is outside, you don't see it. So it looks like the intersection just consists of an interval. Now then there are the smaller intervals. Uh, if your notion of scale is a very large number, you see that for all the things that aren't on that scale, even though there might be a lot of them, their total contribution is small. So the only ones that really govern whether or not it looks monotone on that scale are text intervals whose length is roughly the length of the scale. And if that happens to be small, then it looks like a monotone set on that scale. 